Uh, hello, this is our lecture number seven. This is on genetic influences on behavior. And what I want to do in this lecture is to give you some examples um, from um, a wide array, really, of, of different research findings that have to do with uh, potential genetic influences upon behavior. And uh, then what I want to do is I want to start getting into some of the uh, really interesting twin studies that have been done uh, by, uh, by psychologists and uh, by uh, others in the field of uh, associated fields uh, related to psychology uh, that uh, um, are, have really provided the, uh, the real solid evidence that uh, we're talking about uh, our nature, uh, genes playing a very important role in our behavior. So let's uh, begin this by uh, taking a look at some examples of genetic-based disorders. Uh, then what we will do is we'll move on to artificial uh, selection uh, studies uh, that have been done. Um, and then uh, ultimately to uh, this uh, the really important twin studies uh, in uh, what we call concordance research. Uh, and you see in that uh, cartoon there, um, this uh, criminal uh, being taken off by police, uh, the criminal saying, my genome made me do it. In other words, uh, implying that um, somehow his nature, his genetic background was responsible for his behavior. And I think that, you know, we need, of course, to be able to establish um, uh, solid, you know, experimental evidence uh, to that effect. Uh, and I think that um, in, in a number of different areas of psychology, the psychology investigation, we've been, uh, we've been able to do this. Uh, so one disorder that has been uh, studied uh, quite extensively is uh, one that's called uh, PKU which is the acronym, acronym for phenylketonuria. This is a single gene defect. And of course, uh, we know that there are thousands of genes uh, on each chromosome, uh, and it's the absence uh, of one of them that really results in this syndrome. What you see there uh, <clears throat> is a young girl. Uh, this girl that's in the middle is a girl that uh, is afflicted with this particular disorder. This is her sister here, and this is her mother. Um, and this disorder is, is one that uh, for, for some time was quite uh, perplexing. People didn't really understand it, but we now uh, do know that it is related to a single gene uh, defect. If you take a look at these children, uh, typically they have low IQs. Um, they are uh, shorter um, uh, on average uh, than, uh, than other children. Uh, they have light pigmentation. They also exhibit um, um, irritability, um, uh, higher than normal levels of, of irritability. Uh, and though they appear to be normal uh, at the time of birth, they can deteriorate very rapidly in terms of intelligence. And we've, uh, we've really just uh, over the last 20 years or so, 20 or 25 years, have been able to, to understand a little bit more about what this is related to. So when you take a look at this disorder, um, we talk about this uh, fundamental protein. Uh, that is found in, Mary, uh, in a wide array of dairy products, uh, and it's called phenylalanine. And uh, in uh, uh, children that are afflicted with this disorder, uh, there's a defective gene that, that is preventing the individual from converting this uh, phenylalanine when it's consumed. Uh, preventing them from converting it into other proteins. And as that phenylalanine builds up in the central nervous system, uh, becomes toxic, it starts to attack um, and destroy uh, other cells in the central nervous system. And as a result of that, you get this very uh, progressive kind of um, uh, disability, uh, cognitive disability that occurs. Um, there is a remedy for this. And that remedy is um, um, uh, low uh, phenylalanine uh, diets. Um, 
if um, you know this is something that is suspected and of course we have all kinds of genetic tests now that can be done at the time of birth in order to to uh, see if uh, uh, a child is at risk um, we can automatically put them on uh, low phenylalanine diets and as a consequence of that phenylalanine is not allowed to build up uh, within the central nervous system and as a consequence of that, um, the cognitive uh, changes, uh, that slow deterioration uh, that occurs uh, owing to the, uh, the toxic nature of the phenylalanine when it gets into high concentrations, this is not something that is allowed to occur. So this is a very simple environmental remedy for um, uh, preventing this uh, ge genetic predisposition from um, uh, exerting its influence. Uh, so this is a, you know, a very interesting uh, example, very good example of uh, uh, nature and nurture. Uh, nature has set in motion uh, this genetic disorder, but we can prevent its manifestation simply by changing uh, the environment. And the environment that we change in this case is, is the diet of the individual. Uh, another syndrome, one that you're probably a little bit more familiar with, uh, genetic-based disorder, is called Down syndrome. Uh, this is something that um, occurs uh, throughout the world. Um, it occurs in about one out of every 600 births. Uh, and these um, individuals, for the most part, although there are different gradations uh, of this, of Down syndrome, um, uh, results in, in severe intellectual disabilities. Uh, typically, IQs are, are less than 50. Uh, these are individuals um, whose eyelids uh, superficially resemble those of, uh, of an oriental individual. They have short uh, fingers, uh, small ears, protrude, protruding tongues. Uh, there's a variety of different, very well-known um, uh, physical um, and mental uh, changes that occur uh, in uh, Down syndrome individuals. As a consequence of research that was done in the 1950s and 60s and early 70s, uh, scientists were able to uh, photograph, that is, uh, karyotype uh, cells um, uh, and, and you know, actually map them. So, for example, if you take a look at this figure that you see right here, this is the uh, 21st pair. Uh, of chromosomes, uh, and you can see this extra chromosome that's on the 21st pair. Uh, this is, uh, of course, this uh, abnormal um, uh, to have this extra chromosome. So a Down syndrome child has 47 instead of the normal complement of 46 chromosomes. So uh, one of the things that uh, that scientists have learned about this um, is that uh, this phenomena that is referred to as uh, non-disjunction, where um, at the time of meiosis, when an egg in a female is splitting, um, uh, some of the uh, eggs in this particular situation will produce um, uh, the abnormal uh, complement. So, uh, for example, um, if you have a, a 22 egg a chromosome, uh, 22 chromosome egg that is produced, uh, and that is uh, uh, fertilized, typically what will happen is that there will be um, a miscarriage that will occur within uh, a few months. Uh, of pregnancy. Uh, uh, in contrast, uh, if you have, uh, you know, an additional uh, uh, chromosome, uh, that is what results uh, in this uh, 46 um, uh, uh, complement. Uh, so, uh, again, the genetics of this is uh, uh, very well known, uh, and in some uh, research has been ongoing in this area for a number of years now to try to trace uh, exactly what happens in terms of neural development uh, and brain development in um, individuals with uh, Down syndrome. So again, this is 
something that seems to be related to advancing age uh, in, a, in a female that this uh, abnormal uh, 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 eggs uh, can be produced. Uh, again, the phenomenon referred to as non-disjunction. Non and um, it is uh, uh, something that um, uh, scientists uh, have been able to trace principally because of this ability to uh, photograph, to, to karyotype uh, chromosomes. So the situation now is such that um, uh, a doctor uh, can remove fetal cells from the amniotic fluid uh, through this procedure that you see right here, which is called amniocentesis. Uh, in which they can actually draw off fluid uh, that surrounds the uh, amniotic fluid that surrounds the developing fetus. There are cells that are being sloughed off uh, by the fetus. Uh, those cells end up in the amniotic fluid. So when that fluid is drawn off, uh, we can karyotype those cells and we can determine whether or not uh, the, they have a normal or abnormal complement of cells, uh, of, of chromosomes. So this is um, um, a procedure now which has become standard uh, in medicine. Um, certainly you cannot prevent uh, the manifestation of uh, this particular syndrome uh, <coughs> called Down syndrome, also in earlier days referred to as Mongolism. That is a term which is no longer really used. The, the term Down syndrome is the one that is preferred. Um, and um, uh, again, this is something that occurs worldwide. This is something that we see in, in all different cultures. Uh, and um, uh, there is nothing that we can do uh, uh, to prevent uh, this, this disorder. Certainly, uh, individuals can uh, request, uh, you know, to have an, uh, an abortion. Um, uh, but you know, at some point in the future, uh, maybe we will be able to perform gene substitution therapy where we can, you know, substitute um, uh, uh, chromosomes uh, for uh, uh, those that are, um, are abnormal. Uh, that's a possibility. It's not nothing that's on the horizon right now, but nonetheless, uh, it is something uh, uh, to think about. So again, this is a very well-known uh, genetic disorder, these two, Down syndrome and uh, PKU. Um, let's talk a little bit about artificial selection now and talk about a study that was done some years ago by a psychologist by the name of Tryon, who was uh, uh, performed a study in which he was working with uh, rats uh, and would place them in a maze um, a very difficult maze in which they would have to run from one part of the maze, the start area, to the goal area. There are a number of blind alleys and um, uh, somewhat difficult, you know, for, for animals, uh, for these rats to, to figure out. But with practice, uh, they would get uh, better and better. Uh, what Tryon did was this. Um, he was able to to take a large number of rats and, and place them into this maze and measure uh, their ability to traverse through this maze and get to the goal area to, to have food. And uh, those that were really good at performing uh, this task, uh, males and females, he would mate them together. And those that were, were very poor uh, at this, uh, this task of, of running through this maze and learning this maze, he would also take them, males and females, and mate them together. And he would take a look at their offspring, and he would do this, what he did was do this repeatedly over, over many generations. And uh, that is uh, uh, taking those that were uh, excellent performers and those that were very poor performers, mating, mating them, uh, and again, taking a look at the next uh, generation. And what he found was that after just two generations, 
uh, he was able to select for um, this intelligence uh, on the part of these rats. And you can see that uh, this is the, the number of errors uh, that animals made in this maze, uh, again, as a function of generations. Again, it does this for 20 uh, generations, selected generations. And again, you're, you're engaging in artificial selection based upon a simple characteristic. That is, how well are they in terms of running uh, this uh, maze? And those that run really well, he mates them together. Uh, those that uh, don't uh, run through the maze uh, very rapidly, make a lot of errors, uh, he uh, mates them together and then takes a look at their offspring. So again, take a look at this. They take a look at this dramatic change that is taking place in both the animals uh, that are the uh, bright animals. They're getting better and better. And uh, those animals uh, that he called the maze dull animals, they were getting poorer and poorer with each succeeding generation. So this was certainly one of the first studies that was done um, in the area of artificial selection and uh, intelligence. Uh, and it was a very interesting uh, study, which really prompted a lot of other work in this area. Um, this is uh, uh, a very interesting study um, that you see here that was performed by uh, two researchers by the name of Cooper and Zubek. Here's what they did in their study. Uh, they took um, uh, some of these animals uh, that uh, Tryon had been working with, uh, those that uh, were the really smart ones, the maize bright animals, and those that were the the uh, the ones that were uh, uh, the low performers. And um, what uh, Cooper and Zubek started doing was exposing them to different types of environments. Uh, this is an environment that was an enriched environment where the animal uh, could, uh, the animals could uh, engage in a lot of different activities. There was a lot for them to see, a lot for them to do, a lot for them to manipulate, a lot for them to climb on and climb over. And um, uh, other animals, on the other hand, were exposed to a very um, deprived uh, environment in which they did not have all of these things uh, that the animals could uh, see and manipulate. Um, and uh, what uh, Cooper and Zubek found was that he was able to, to reverse those genetically based um, predispositions. Uh, for example, when he took uh, animals that were maize bright animals and placed them into a impoverished environment, what he found was that uh, their offspring uh, uh, did not perform anywhere near uh, as well. And again, made a lot of errors. Uh, in contrast, the animals that were exposed to this uh, very uh, enriched kind of environment, uh, their offspring uh, over succeeding generations of being exposed to this enriched environment, uh, even though they had the genetic potential as being low performers, that enriched environment uh, elevated uh, the ability of those future generations to do uh, better and better. So again, a simple manipulation of the environment, in this case, uh, an enriched environment or an impoverished environment can have dramatic effects. Uh, upon these genetic uh, potential. If you take a look at this groundbreaking piece of research by uh, Marianne Diamond and Mark Rosenzweig. Uh, Marianne Diamond was an anatomist, Mark Rosenzweig was a psychologist at, uh, um, at uh, UC Berkeley. Uh, and what they did was they exposed animals to, to uh, these different environments, either an impoverished environment or an enriched environment. And what they found was uh, differences in the anatomy uh, uh, of these animals, their brains in terms of the cells of their brains. This is what a brain cell looks like in an animal exposed to an impoverished environment. This is what a brain cell looks like uh, in the case uh, of an uh, enriched um, uh, animal, uh, an animal exposed to this enriched environment that you see here. Uh, so um, again, you get this, these, uh, this dendritic sprouting, uh, these branches uh, that are occurring here that are much more elaborate than what you see in the case of an impoverished animal. 
So uh, another thing that uh, what uh, Rosenzweig and Diamond were, ever, were able to find was that these enriched environments uh, increase spatial uh, uh, learning. Uh, and um, uh, the animals that were exposed to that enrichment had thicker cerebral cortexes and elevated blood supplies. And again, uh, not something that you see that you saw in animals that were impoverished, whose spatial learning was uh, quite poor, uh, whose brain cells uh, were dramatically uh, uh, smaller and less elaborate. Uh, and again, uh, not the thick kind of cortex that you saw, cerebral cortex that you saw in the case of these enriched animals and not the elevated blood supply to the brain. So this is very clear cut evidence, you know, that um, uh, different types of environments can dramatically influence uh, the brain and the development of the brain. You know, this is, uh, this is very important work because now <clears throat> we're, we're trying to balance out the effects of nature and the effects of nurture that yes genes are having a, a dramatic effect but we can can alter the, uh, that genetic predisposition in terms of uh, the impact that it's having on behavior by simply changing the environment so uh, again this argues for us taking a broad look um, at uh, both genes and environment as playing a role uh, in behavior um, you know Psychologists um, have uh, been utilizing twins, uh, identical twins and fraternal twins in research for a long time. And that research now uh, is, is simply called concordance research. And um, to, to understand this research and its importance in this area, I want you to focus your attention on this figure that you see right here. Um, if we take a look at identical twins, identical twins develop from one sperm and one egg. Uh, the zygote divides, uh, and then you have two individuals with identical chromosomes, complete 100% sharing. And, typical, and the offspring are either both male or both female. Fraternal twins, on the other hand, um, two sperm fertilize two uh, different eggs. And um, what you have is two zygotes. They share some chromosomes, maybe 50% or so, but it's not complete sharing. And they are the same or um, opposite sex. So uh, when we begin to take a look at this research that is called concordance research, um, we're asking the question, you know, what happens when we take a look at identical twins and fraternal twins in terms of a behavioral physical characteristic? Uh, do you see the presence of the trait of the same trait in both members of a pair of twins? And if it is something that's genetically predisposed, you would expect that degree of similarity would be higher in identical twins than in fraternal twins. Again, simply because those identical twins have identical genes. Fraternal twins, on the other hand, don't share, uh, uh, you know, 100%. They share maybe about 50% uh, in terms of uh, their, their genetic background, their, their chromosomes. So these studies then become extremely important in terms of identifying um, uh, whether or not to what extent a particular behavioral or physical trait is, is uh, predisposed by, by genes. Now let's talk, again, understanding that research, and let's talk now about this, this fascinating uh, story of uh, uh, what's called the Jim Twins. Uh, these were identical twins uh, that were put up for adoption and raised as babies by different couples. They did not know that uh, about each other at all for a very long period of time. But in 1979, they were reconnected, and it was found that they had um, striking similarities. Uh, both had dogs that were named Toy. Um, they took family vacations in St. Petersburg, Florida. They married uh, women with the same name, Linda, and they also got divorced. Uh, they both served as sheriffs uh, in their community. Uh, they enjoyed carpentry. They liked to smoke Salem cigarettes. They drank Miller Lite beer. 
they had the same kind of, of crooked smile. They both had the same voice. They admitted to leaving love notes for their wives around the house. These are just some of the similarities uh, between uh, these two individuals, again, who were reconnected later uh, in life. They didn't know that each other uh, existed. And this really launched uh, uh, an examination, you know, of, of twins, uh, of identical twins and fraternal twins. Uh, and in particular, it launched the, the investigation um, and the, uh, the start of what's called the Minnesota Study of Twins Reared Apart. And this was Dr. Thomas Bouchard. Uh, these are studies that are still going on at the University of Minnesota. Um, they identified uh, initially in their first study 137 identical twins reared apart. Now this doesn't this doesn't happen too often. Um, you know the preference is of course to rear uh, individuals in the same family when they're put up for adoption, but uh, there are cases where they are separated and put in different families. And um, if you take a look, um, you know, they, they were studied in terms of their mental skills, vocabulary, visual memory, uh, uh, mathematical skills, spatial skills, uh, standardized tests of intelligence, um, you know, physiological tests in terms of the integrity of their heart and lung function, brainwave patterns, personality tests, the uh, complete sexual histories. Um, it, this, uh, the extent of these studies in terms of their completeness is, is really phenomenal. And what they found was that there were striking, absolutely striking similarities uh, between uh, these uh, identical twins that had been reared apart. Again, suggesting, you know, that there's a very strong genetic component uh, to many different aspects of behavior uh, in physiology. Uh, there's just a couple of slides here of some identical twins and, and some similarities, uh, very important similarities between the two of them. These, these two girls, six-year-old girls that you see here, uh, again, identical twins. And interestingly, both um, uh, have been diagnosed with mild uh, autism. Uh, and again, that's a disorder <laughs> that we're going to learn more about later on that is linked uh, to, there is a genetic predisposition to it. So again, this is, you know, very interesting that, uh, that these identical twins should both uh, suffer from the same uh, disorder. Uh, another interesting case of identical twins, this is Loretta and Lorraine. Uh, Loretta was diagnosed with breast cancer uh, a few years back. Lorraine uh, was in the doctor's office with her, and uh, at the time they thought, well, Loretta asked if Lorraine should probably be checked as well. And the doctor indeed discovered that Lorraine also had breast cancer. And again, both were treated, treated successfully. But, um, you know, things like cancer, for example, uh, there's very strong uh, linkages to genetic uh, uh, predisposition. So then this launched, um, uh, you know, a whole series of, of studies in this area. But again, I want to go back and just, you know, remind you of, uh, you know, why psychologists are interested in studying identical twins and, and fraternal twins. And, you know, it's the, this concordance, the presence of the same trait in both members of a pair of twins. When one member of an identical twin pair, for example, uh, or fraternal twin pair, when one member is identified, let's say, with schizophrenia, what's the likelihood that the other one uh, will also be diagnosed with it? Um, again, if you, if you see that this happens more, uh, in identical twins, in contrast to fraternal twins, that is this uh, degree of agreement uh, that we call concordance, then there's very strong suspicion uh, that this is uh, something that can be linked uh, to an underlying genetic cause. Um, so uh, here's uh, concordance rates that we see in monozygotic and dizygotic twins for a variety of different traits. And again, identical twins, they're developing from uh, a single fertilized egg by a single sperm, it splits in two, and again, they are sharing all of their genes. Fraternal twins, on the other hand, separate eggs fertilized by, by separate sperm, they share only about half of their genes. 
So take a look at this in terms of blood type uh, in the concordance rate in monozygotic twins, that is identicals, is 100%. In dizygotics, it's only about 66%. Take a look at eye color. Uh, in monozygotic twins, the degree of uh, concordance that is of agreement in terms of eye color, that is when one member of an identical twin pair has blue eyes, 99% uh, of the time the, the other one will too. Or when one member has uh, brown eyes, um, uh, the likelihood that the other one will, will as well is, is 99%. Uh, in contrast to uh, dizygotics, fraternal twins, where it's only 28%. This is a highly significant statistical difference between here and between here. Uh, take a look at intellectual impairment. When one member of an identical twin pair is intellectually impaired, 97% of the time, the other one will be too. In the case of dizygotic twins, it's only 37%. Uh, in the case of uh, measles, the concordance rate in monozygotics is 95%. In dizygotics, it's only 87%. This, too, is a significant difference. Uh, when you take a look at uh, uh, epilepsy, of which there are many different forms, so when you take a look at just you know one type of, um, of uh, epilepsy, we call this idiopathic epilepsy, uh, seven out of 10 times uh, when one member of a monozygotic twin pair uh, is uh, uh, diagnosed with uh, epilepsy um, uh, seven out of ten times the other one will be uh, diagnosed uh, with the same disorder. Uh, in dizygotics it's only 15 percent. Uh, take a look at schizophrenia. Seven out of ten times when one member of an identical twin pair is diagnosed with schizophrenia, the other one will be too. Only 10 percent of the time in, in the case of dizygotics. If you take a look at diabetes, um, uh, the concordance rate is 65% in monozygotics. Um, that is that degree of agreement. So, you know, roughly six to seven times uh, out of 10, uh, when one member is diagnosed with diabetes, the other one will be too. In dizygotics, that is fraternal twins, it's only about 18%. This is a highly significant difference. When you take a look at allergies, uh, again, six out of ten times when one member of an identical twin pair is diagnosed with uh, a particular type of allergy, the other one will be too. Only 5% of the time in the case of uh, fraternal twins. Tuberculosis, uh, roughly, you know, between uh, five and six uh, times um, uh, more likely uh, 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 when one member is diagnosed with tuberculosis, the other one will be too. This is only about uh, two out of ten times in the case of dizygotics. So this is very powerful evidence that, that these physical characteristics and behavioral characteristics are ones that are genetically determined. Uh, that there's a high degree of, uh, of genetic uh, involvement. Uh, and indeed, we're going to be coming back to this uh, on a number of other uh, occasions, but this is very, very powerful uh, information that really has helped us uh, to uh, more completely understand um, the degree to which genes may be influencing um, our behavior. Um, so um, we're going to, you know, uh, continue on um, by, by taking a look at um, uh, uh, more in terms of the biological basis of behavior in our uh, in our future uh, uh, lectures, uh, but for now let's just say that yes, genes are exerting a very important influence. You take a look at some of these studies that we've talked about, uh, and um, indeed we we really need to know more about the biology of behavior. A topic that we're going to be studying over our next few lectures in, in order to, to help us to understand um, uh, the degree to which our behavior is related to genes in our biology and the degree to which it is related to, to nurture. So that's coming up in future lectures.